Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, the top six employee training topics, requirements, and best practices to protect employees, sponsored by J.J. Keller. My name is Kevin Drulli. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. Additionally, the slides for today's event are available for download under the Resources widget at the bottom left portion of your screen. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speakers today will be Edwin Zaleski and Ann Potras. Edwin is a senior editor at J.J. Keller who specializes in workplace safety topics, including walking working surfaces, powered industrial trucks, and injury illness record keeping. He also researches and creates content for products covering various other safety-related topics. Anne is an associate editor on J.J. Keller's Human Resources Publishing Team who researches and creates content on numerous employment-related subject matters, including employment law. Edwin, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thanks, Kevin. I first want to just put up our disclaimer. This basically says that although the information we're presenting is current as of today, of course, it's based on regulations. Regulations may change, and so we have our legal disclaimer as part of our presentation. And uh, as Kevin mentioned, we're sponsoring J.J. Keller here, and J.J. Keller particularly is sponsoring through our Training on Demand feature. We'll give you a little bit more information about that later in the presentation, but I'm sure you all want to jump right in. So I'm going to start with today's agenda. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're going to discuss the six training topics covering both OSHA and some human resources areas. Now, of the OSHA topics you see here, three of them actually appear in OSHA's top 10 violations list every year. Those include HAZCOM, Hazard Communication, Powered Industrial Trucks, and Lockout Tagout. We've added bloodborne pathogens because we get a lot of questions about it. For human resources, we're going to be covering bullying and active shooter training, as well as sexual harassment. Now, sexual harassment gets a lot of media attention, but don't forget about other types of harassment, like that based on race or religion or other classes. Now, most of what we're going to cover in the bullying and sexual harassment areas will, of course, apply more broadly to other areas. So let's jump right in with our first topic, which is hazard communication. Now, HAZCOM is the most frequently cited OSHA training violation within general industry. It's also one of the more confusing OSHA regulations, but it does affect over 5 million workplaces. Now, even before the changes based on the globally harmonized system, the GHS, took place in 2012, this regulation was cited more than 3,000 times every year. So we're going to look at the who, the what, the when, why, and how of the HASCOM training provision today. You do need to train all workers who may be exposed to hazardous chemicals under normal operating conditions or in foreseeable emergencies. Now that means potential exposure from things like an uncontrolled or accidental spill. It has to be an emergency, not just an incidental necessarily, but still if you have a significant spill in a warehouse, even though the employees don't work with chemicals necessarily, they could be covered. If you have contractors on site, the standard requires that the host and the contractor exchange information so that each employer can train their own workers. That does include if you have temps from a staffing agency. Staffing agencies and host employers are jointly responsible for training temp workers. Generally, the staffing agency should provide generic training, but the host company must offer the specific training because it's the one that uses or produces particular chemicals, 
creates and controls the hazard, and of course, it's best suited to provide temp workers with site-specific training, like where to find safety data sheets. Uh, generally, office workers, bank tellers, and those who don't encounter chemicals or do so only in non-routine or isolated incidents, they are not covered by the HASCOM rule. So OSHA does not specify who can present HASCOM training, and there's no formal certification or specific, specific qualifications required to do so. But you, the employer, are responsible for ensuring that your workers are adequately trained. And that means employers need to decide who they think is qualified to conduct that training. And do keep in mind, OSHA does allow contractor-provided training, such as through a third party, hiring a third party to come do the training. Now, training needs to cover the details of your written hazard communication program, including information about things like uh, the labels on shipped containers, and if you use an in-house or workplace labeling system, information on that. Uh, for example, if your in-house labeling system includes HMIS or NFPA rating systems, the employees need to understand what those systems mean and how to use the information. Some, some employers still have chemicals labeled under the old HASCOM standard, the one prior to 2012, in which case they need to provide training on that labeling system as well. Workers have to understand that the labeling system has changed since those items were purchased. And of course, workers need to know where they can get information on the hazards of those chemicals. Another training element covers safety data sheets, or SDSs. This has to cover how to obtain and use the hazard information on the SDS and going over the format of the SDS. And in fact, also, if you have older material safety data sheets, or MSDSs, for products, you might have gotten those prior to June 1, 2015, you need to cover the differences between MSDSs and SDSs and how to use both. Some of the other training elements include uh, what operations have hazardous chemicals, including byproducts, uh, the location and availability of your written program, your chemical inventory, and of course, where to find the SDSs, how you monitor for hazardous chemicals, uh, any hazardous chemicals in the individual's work area, and that might be things like flammables or corrosives, and of course, measures that workers can take to protect themselves. That could be work practices, emergency procedures, and very commonly, personal protective equipment they might use. A training is required <clears throat> at the time a worker is assigned to work with any hazardous chemical and may be required when a new hazard is introduced. Now, the need for additional training is based on the hazard, not the chemical. So if someone is working with a flammable solvent and a different flammable solvent is introduced, the training should not need to be updated. But as I mentioned, if a corrosive is introduced, that's a new hazard, so additional training is going to be needed. Now, some employers choose to initially train based on the chemicals used. And if you have a small number of chemicals, you could discuss the hazards of each one. Then if a new chemical creates a hazard that workers have not been trained about, the retraining can be limited to that particular hazard. In multi-employer work sites, uh, the employer must provide updated training when its workers are exposed to new hazards, and that applies even if those hazards are created by other employers. Now, we get a lot of questions on refresher training. Refresher training is not actually required under HASCOM, but if you train your employees and assume they're going to remember everything for years without any refreshers, and that could be a risky assumption. So it is a good idea to at least periodically quiz your employees, check their knowledge, and if they seem to be lacking, provide retraining on the areas needed. So why is training required? Well, obviously HASCOM training explains and reinforces the information that employees get through labels and through SDSs. Training, of course, also gives workers an opportunity to ask questions. Now, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, this standard gets cited so often is probably confusion over the consumer use provision. Now, when employees use cleaning products or lubricants, like most of us have at home in our kitchen or our garage, that use might be excluded 
from the HAZCOM standard. But it's only excluded if the exposure duration and frequency is similar to typical consumer or household use. So for example, if employees are using a window cleaner, but they're using it eight hours a day and several days a week, or maybe if maintenance workers are using a degreaser, but they're using it constantly throughout the day, multiple times a week, their exposure is probably beyond typical consumer use. So even though it's a product that might be purchased over the counter, they still need training to understand the hazards of that chemical. Now training does have to be provided, of course, at no cost to workers, and that's going to be counted as paid working time. They should be paid for time they spend in training. A training does involve giving more than uh, some safety data sheets for your workers to read. Your training program should explain not only the hazards of the chemicals, but how to use the information presented. A training might consist of classroom instruction, interactive video, and online courses. However, OSHA has explained that workers must have the opportunity to ask questions and receive timely responses. So certainly online courses can be used or computer-based, but someone's got to be available to answer questions. And of course, training must be understandable. So if your supervisors give job instructions in a language other than English, then HASCOM training should be delivered in that language. Or if employees have limited reading skills or language skills, training must be provided so they can understand it. So if they can't read, re written materials aren't going to work, but it might be oral or verbal instruction. And as I said, you can either cover categories of hazards or you can cover specific chemicals, whether you want to be hazard-based or chemical-based. And finally, of course, training has to be effective. OSHA inspectors may ask workers if they know where to find the safety data sheets and if they understand the health effects of the chemicals they work with or if they know what to do in an emergency. Now, if workers can't answer those questions, OSHA can cite you for failure to provide training even if you have documentation that you provided the training. It wasn't effective. This is why I mentioned earlier, you may want to quiz your own employees occasionally. And so that, that training, it has to be effective, and that means that employees have to understand and, of course, remember key information. All right, I hope that was helpful. Our next section I'm going to move on to is on powered industrial trucks, or what we call PITs. So you hear me use that acronym here. Now, PITs include forklifts, powered pallet jacks, stand-up lift trucks, order pickers, things like that. One major compliance issue, and I noted this was also in OSHA's top 10, is failing to train operators on all the types of equipment they operate. So even a powered pallet jack requires training, and it has to be specific to that equipment. Now, you don't necessarily have to train on every pallet jack from every different manufacturer, but an operator who was trained to drive a sit-down forklift like you see on your screen here cannot operate a powered pallet jack. They need additional training. OSHA also requires refresher training here, but only under certain circumstances. Now, there's no specified frequency, but you do need to do retraining when there's an accident or a near miss, when the operator is observed operating unsafely, of course, if the operator is assigned to drive a different type of truck, it uh, could be that a condition in the workplace changes in a way that could affect safe operation of the truck. You've done some construction or changed things up. You may need to do training on that. Or if an evaluation of the operator's performance reveals safety concerns, retraining may, need, may, may be needed. Now, <clears throat> those evaluations have to be done at least once every three years, according to the regulation. You can, of course, do them more frequently if you choose. Now, what about temporary employees? Well, OSHA has what they call a Temporary Worker Initiative, TWI Bulletin, and it says that a staffing agency is responsible for generic training, but again, the host employer is in the best position to provide site-specific training and evaluation since the host employer is familiar with the equipment used, and, of course, with any hazardous or other particular conditions of the worksite. Now, if the staffing agency supplies trained operators, 
The host employer must verify that training, but then deliver additional training on the types of trucks and the working conditions at the facility. The host employer must also evaluate each operator. Now, they don't need to duplicate the staffing agency training, the training already provided. So training provided by the host employer may not be as extensive as initial training given to other employees. The staffing agency, of course, may be in the best position to keep training and evaluation records. Now, OSHA actually says the host employer is not required to maintain or store copies of the training records for temps. But the host employer does need to know where those records are located because they have to make them accessible to OSHA during an inspection. So the host company and the staffing agency may want to share those records so they can both verify that the training was completed. Now, OSHA's requirements are performance-based, so employers can tailor a training program to their workplaces and to the types of trucks operated. The regulations outline the truck-related topics that have to be covered. They include the items listed here, and there's some others. It's, it's a long list, but we've got most of them on here. And I would point out that a 1999 letter of interpretation, OSHA addressed a question of whether training must be specific to the weight and brand of the PIT. I touched on this earlier. Now, OSHA said the training is not based on weight or brand or manufacturer, but it's based on whether the trucks differ with respect to one or more of the truck-related topics outlined in this standard, as you see here. So looking a little third from the bottom, vehicle capacity and stability. Different types of trucks are going to have different capacity and stability. That would require different types of training. Now, the regulations outline workplace-specific topics, and again, most of them are listed here. We fit in as many as we could. Again, an older letter of interpretation, OSHA said that an operator trained and evaluated at one facility may need additional training to work at another facility if the two locations are different regarding one or more of these workplace-specific topics. Now, it may happen that all of the potential hazards are virtually identical, in which case no additional training or evaluation would be necessary. But some employers do have multiple warehouses, for example, even on the same uh, piece of property. If an employee goes from one area to the other and there's new hazards, they may need additional training. But on the other hand, if everyone has the same types of ramps, the same width of aisles, things like that, then additional training on these topics should not be required. But more training would be required, though, if, for example, the loads to be handled differ significantly in things like composition or stability. They need to know how to handle the loads as well. Now, according to the regulations, training must be a combination of formal instruction, practical training, and evaluation. A formal instruction usually means classroom. It could be a lecture, a discussion. It could be interactive computer learning could be watching a video, uh, computer-based training, going over written material. Practical training means demonstrations performed by the trainer, trainee and exercises performed by the trainee so that basically it's like teaching someone to drive. You show them how to do it, you let them uh, perform the exercises themselves. That's hands-on. And finally, the trainer has to evaluate the operator's performance in the workplace like handling loads and using the truck, performing typical duties that they would be expected to do on the job. Now, the regulations do address duplicate training, and there's no need for additional training in a particular topic if the operator was previously trained on it and it was appropriate for the truck and for the working conditions encountered, and, of course, the operator was properly evaluated and was found to be competent. All right, now, one of the big questions we get, what about the trainer qualifications? Well, OSHA's regulation simply says the trainer must have the knowledge, training, and experience needed to conduct the training. OSHA said the necessary qualifications could be obtained in a variety of ways. This could be through years of having operated a PIT and knowledge of safe practices and knowledge of the OSHA regulations. 
It could involve going to a train the trainer course or a similar course on being an instructor, or it could be a combination of that experience and training. The one specific criteria that OSHA lays out is from a 2003 letter of interpretation. It says that the trainer must, at some point, have operated the type of equipment they're training on so they can describe how the equipment works and feels. So a potential trainer cannot simply watch a video and read the regulation and then be qualified to deliver training. They have to have operated at at least some point. Now the employer is responsible to designate someone that you feel can deliver the required information in an understandable manner and who can evaluate operators to ensure they have the proper skills and knowledge. And frankly, be prepared to state your case to OSHA as to why the person you've chosen is a suitable trainer. Again, forklifts become one of OSHA's top 10 violation standards, and training is a big part of that. Um, if employees are observed by an OSHA inspector operating in an unsafe manner, OSHA does not give the operator a ticket like a police officer. They cite the employer for not doing proper training. All right, and finally, training records. Uh, the trainer does need to certify that each operator has been trained and evaluated as required by the regulations. That certification must include the name of the operator, the date of the training and evaluation, and the identity of the person performing the training or evaluation. Now, federal OSHA doesn't actually require giving a certification or a license to the operator, but a lot of employers choose to do this, give you a little operator card. And actually, the one state we know of, Michigan, actually, I believe, does require employers to hand out uh, a certification or kind of a license to forklift operators. All right. I'm going to take a break in a moment and move on to bullying and active shooter, passing things to Ann. But first, I want to give all of our attendees an opportunity to receive more information about J.J. Keller's training solutions. You can use the poll on your screen to select your interests. We know that effective safety pr training programs not only help you comply with OSHA or Department of Transportation and, frankly, human resource requirements, they help you reduce accidents, reduce injuries, keep your workers' compensation rates under control, help you improve employee engagement and morale, and preserve your company's reputation. So whatever your training needs, J.J. Keller can help. Uh, we have 24-7 access, access to hundreds of online courses and streaming video across multiple industries. So with our options, training's never been easier. Hope you have a chance to select something on the poll here if you're interested. And then I am going to move on and turn things over to Anne to talk a little bit about bullying an active shooter. All right. Thank you, Ed. And I hope everyone had a chance to make a selection in that poll. Um, we do have some great training products on these topics, actually. Um, so now we're going to change gears a bit and talk about bullying and active shooter training. So, um, Bullying, I think you, everyone knows, bullying is offensive behavior. And like it's like other forms of harassment, but it doesn't usually rise to the level of illegal like the other forms because it's not typically based on membership in a protected class. So that would be something like age or gender or religion and things like that. However, you should still address bullying whenever it occurs because it is a big deal. Bullying is actually a type of workplace violence. Um, and it can include any type of threatening or humiliating or intimidating behavior, but it can also include things like eye rolling or sarcasm or other smaller but disrespectful behaviors like ridiculing an employee's work or their ideas. And it typically involves repeated behavior. So one single negative incident might, not, uh, might be dealt with under your workplace conduct rules, but if you see a pattern developing, then you might have a bullying situation on your hands. So while bullying might not be illegal, like we said, it's still unprofessional and it's unacceptable. And you know every employee deserves to be treated with civility and respect at work. But bullying is still quite common. According to the Healthy Workplace Campaign, uh, as you can see, bullying is four times more prevalent than illegal discrimination and harassment. 
And other studies have found that many workers reported bullying at work, and about two-thirds have actually quit or lost a job because of bullying. So obviously, bullying can impact your company's bottom line as well, because employees who are bullied can experience increased stress and related health effects, which can then increase the use of sick leave and even cause them to quit their jobs or request a transfer or something like that. So we've got a little overlap on uh, our poll or our our chart here on the screen, but uh, we're going to talk about something that most people are pretty focused on these days, which is active shooters. No employer wants to deal with bullying or harassment or violence in the workplace, but if a situation goes too far before employers realize that it should have been dealt with, uh, in the worst case scenario, it can escalate into what your worst nightmare might be, and that would be an active shooter situation. Now, the FBI identified 277 active shooter incidents between 2000 and 2018. Nearly a third of those incidents happened in just three years, so from 2016 to 2018. Also, the FBI categorizes events that happen in business environments, which they call areas of commerce. They categorize this differently from those that occur in places like healthcare facilities and government offices. But remember that those locations also have employees. Basically what this means is that more than three quarters of these events are happening where people are working. We don't have the 2019 data quite yet, but it seems like it definitely followed the trend. So we're expecting those numbers not to be great either. And the thought of a violent act occurring in your workplace is a terrible one, we know that, but don't assume that it can't happen to you. Employers should take steps to minimize the potential for workplace violence and protect their employees sooner rather than later. One of the most important things employers can do is to maintain and enforce a policy against bullying and workplace violence that includes a process for reporting and addressing any indication of violence. Employees who bully or intimidate or threaten others need to be addressed. More subtle signs of possible violence should also be noted in your policy and your employees should know about them. Some of these warning signs can include things like we see on the slide here. Um, any big change, especially in health or hygiene habits or a sudden change in the person's personality might not be just a sign of violence. It might be just a sign that your employee needs some help. And employers and employees must resist the temptation to ignore these potential signs. Think of addressing this conduct as a way to help employees deal with their frustrations before a situation escalates into something much more serious. Now, most active shooter situations last just minutes. In fact, most of them end before law enforcement arrives. And employees need to be prepared to protect themselves because they might be their only shot. The Department of Homeland Security recommends three steps in order, and I'm sure you've heard of them. Um, so the employees should definitely first try to avoid or run. They should avoid the shooter. If there is an escape path, that is always the best choice. An employee should always be aware of the surroundings noting possible exits because if an active shooter situation arises they're going to need to leave their belongings behind and evacuate whether or not others agree to follow them now if an employee is unable to avoid or evacuate the next option is to find a place that is totally out of view and deny the shooters access to them sometimes it's hiding sometimes it's you know whatever the best way is but once they are out of the shooter's view they should lock any doors and block them with heavy furniture if they can silence cell phones turn off lights and just stay out of the view of any windows and they should definitely not try to hide under desks or in an open area that's sometimes people's first instinct but it just does not work now if the first two strategies are not options if they cannot avoid and they cannot deny employees might have no choice but to try to defend themselves and this is this can be really scary, but teaching them that they have this option can let them take the power back. So when this is the only option, employees can try to identify improvised weapons around them, and they can use things like fire extinguishers or scissors or even a hot pot of coffee can help incapacitate a shooter. And multiple employees can work together if necessary. Now, most employees will never have to use strategies like this but educating them what they can do can help them calm their fears and prepare them to act if it does happen. And in the unlikely, very unlikely event that an active shooter situation does occur, this type of preparation can save lives. 
over to Ed for a little less intense topic. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anne. Yeah, we're going to move on a little bit to uh, lockout tagout, as I mentioned, of the four OSHA topics. This is the third one that appears in OSHA's top 10. Now, a good lockout tagout program is only as good as the training provided. Uh, OSHA requires training employees based on their duties. Uh, they might be considered an authorized or affected or other employee. Now, in all cases, employees need to understand the purpose and function of your energy control program. The authorized employees do the servicing, the maintenance, and the repair. They're the ones who apply locks or tags and follow the lockout tagout procedures. Affected employees, they're people who use a machine, and when a machine is down for service or maintenance, the employee can't use it, so he or she is affected by the lockout. Affected employees don't do the maintenance, but they do need to steer clear of the equipment during repairs and know not to mess around with locks or tags. And other employees are those whose work activities are or may be in an area where energy control procedures are used. And again, they need to recognize and understand the tags and know what's going on here. So let's talk a little bit about the level of training. As you might have guessed, authorized employees need the most training. They must recognize hazardous energy sources, understand the type and magnitude of energy that's available in the workplace, and they need to know how to isolate equipment from its energy sources. It may be different for each machine. Affected employees should be trained to recognize machine malfunctions. They need to know how to report a problem and initiate maintenance, and as I said, they need to know not to mess around with tags or things like that. And then the other employees should be instructed about the lockout tag or procedure, the purpose, and the prohibition on attempting to use or restart machines or equipment which have been locked out or tagged out. Now, we know a lot of people use temp workers, so again, we're going to bring this up that OSHA expects temporary employees to receive the same training as regular employees. So if you use temps from a staffing agency, be aware that the Temporary Worker Initiative, TWI, Bulletin 10, OSHA says that if there's a temp worker performing activities covered by the lockout tagout standard, then the host employer is responsible for ensuring that worker is properly trained and understands those policies or procedures. So it's very likely that temps could be those other employees who work in an area. They may not be doing service or maintenance, but they would need to know your procedures. And then, of course, some people do bring in uh, outside contractors to perform work, in which case you may need to coordinate your lockout procedures. All right, some other topics to cover. Uh, when tagout is used, all of the authorized affected and other employees must be trained in the limitations of tags. Tags are essentially warning devices and they don't provide the same level of physical restraint that a lock provides. Tags, they must know that tags are not to be removed without permission of the authorized person who's responsible for them and that tags should never be bypassed, ignored, or otherwise defeated as OSHA puts it. Tags may create a false sense of security, and employees need to be aware of that as well. Employees also have to be instructed that tags must be legible and understandable by all authorized, affected, and other employees. That's what makes them effective, is that everyone understands what they're there for. OSHA has said it's not the material you're using, but the training you provide that makes a difference here. Tags, of course, have to be made of materials that can stand up to the environmental conditions in the workplace whether you're using chemicals or whatever, and they have to be securely attached to energy isolating devices so that they cannot be inadvertently or accidentally removed. Now, employees, when do you train them? Well, first, initially or prior to performing any service or maintenance work on equipment or systems. Uh, you may need to do training as needed, and OSHA says that's necessary to maintain proficiency. And, of course, if you have any new or revised procedures, employees need to be trained on that. Now, lockout tagout does not have an annual training requirement, but it does require periodic inspections, and those should help with keeping your authorized employees up to speed. 
Now, there is no annual training for affected employees or other employees, but I've put a part of the regulation on this slide here, which does point out the regular regulation requires keeping your training up to date. So if changes are made, further training could be required. Uh, the lockout tagout standard also requires documentation of your training. Specifically, it says that you must certify that employee training has been accomplished and that it's being kept up to date. Typically, the certification contains the employee's name and the dates of training. Uh, different regulations have different standards for what gets put in the training records, but this one's pretty straightforward. All right, we jumped through that fairly quickly, but as I said, there's a lot of specifics in lockout tagout. I know there's going to be questions coming in on this. We'll answer them as best as we can. I got a bunch that came in already on some of the other topics, so keep your questions coming in. And I am going to move on to bloodborne pathogens. We'll have some time for your questions at the end. But bloodborne pathogens, I know we've already seen some questions. So what is this? Well, this standard is meant to protect workers from exposure to things like hepatitis B, HIV, or other microorganisms that are transmitted through blood or, frankly, through certain other body fluids. This regulation does not just apply in healthcare. In fact, there's an OSHA letter of interpretation that flat out says, and I'm quoting, the bloodborne pathogen standard is not meant solely for employees in healthcare settings. So this rule can and does apply in places like manufacturing, service industry, government, other industries. In fact, nearly half of the annual bloodborne pathogen citations that OSHA issues are given to industries other than healthcare. Now, even though this regulation has been around for many years, it's still one of the most commonly cited with about 500 federal OSHA violations each year, and that's not counting states. You know, a lot of the states, half the states are state plan. There could be even more in the state equivalent. So this applies to any general industry employer that has one or more workers with occupational exposure. So for example, bloodborne pathogen standard would cover a janitor who cleans a contaminated surface after an employee cut himself and dripped blood on that surface. That is exposure to blood. If you have even one worker with that kind of occupational exposure, your company is covered. Now, bloodborne pathogens does not apply to construction, so OSHA relies on the general duty clause along with con other construction training provisions to make sure workers are protected. OSHA has indicated that first aid providers at construction sites are expected to receive basic instruction in bloodborne pathogens and to be given vaccination and follow-up in the event of an exposure incident. Of course, they may need appropriate personal protective equipment and appropriate waste containers for handling contaminated items. Now, although federal OSHA does not otherwise apply bloodborne pathogens to construction, be aware that states which have adopted, I mentioned half the states are state plan, some of them have adopted bloodborne pathogen rules specific to the construction industry. So that's something to keep in mind as well. All right, I use this phrase occupational exposure, but what are we talking about? Well, it means reasonably anticipated contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials, we call that OPIM, that may result from the performance of an employee's job duties. Now, that exposure could be through the skin, it could be uh, you know, splashes in the eye through a mucous membrane or through other contact. Now, that contact must result from the performance of the employee's duties. So, as an example, an office worker would not reasonably anticipate having contact with blood or OPIM. But if that office worker is trained in first aid and you expect that worker to provide first aid to injured coworkers, that would create reasonably anticipated contact with blood. And so the person does have occupational exposure and is covered by the bloodborne pathogen standard. So designated first aid responders that render medical assistance as part of their job duties, they do have occupational exposure. Now you may, some employers do train some workers in first aid or maybe CPR, 
but maybe they do not designate them as first aid responders. Heck, some companies, you know, offer CPR training just as a as a wellness initiative. If your employees are trained, but they are not designated as responders, they are not expected to perform first aid, well, then they do not have occupational exposure, so they are not covered by the Bloodborne Pathogen Standard. Remember, it has to be an expectation of their job duties to provide that first aid assistance. On the other hand, it might be a good idea to have your first aid or CPR trainer tell them that if they see someone at work in need of medical attention, uh, they may want to contact the company's designated first responders and they may want to train themselves a little bit on bloodborne pathogen hazards. They could act as good Samaritans anyway and choose to respond, but the OSHA rule does not cover good Samaritans. No employer can anticipate which employees would choose to act as good Samaritans, so you can't anticipate those exposures. That means people who voluntarily assist an injured coworker at work they are not covered by the bloodborne pathogen standard. It wasn't an occupational expectation. Now, unfortunately, OSHA can't tell you what jobs have occupational exposure, so you need to make that determination. But the jobs listed here may have occupational exposure, not necessarily in all cases, but they might. And of course, as we said, depending, it could even be office workers who may have occupational exposure, depending on your expectations. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ann for sexual harassment training. All right. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, we're going to get into our last topic of the day here. Um, Okay. So I think everyone has seen the seemingly endless headlines about sexual harassment by public figures or, you know, executives, and they are disturbing. But remember that it's not just high profile organizations that need to be concerned about this because sexual harassment can and does happen anywhere. Companies of all sizes do have a duty to provide a workplace free of harassment for their employees. But as you can see on the slide, when 48% of women are reporting that they experience sexual harassment in their workplace, it's clear that a lot of employers just are not succeeding in their responsibility. And because of this potential liability, along with the, the increased awareness that has happened lately on this topic, We wanted to include it in the topics we were talking about today for sure. So the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, you might know them as the EEOC, their data from 2019 showed that employers paid out a record of $68.2 million to settle claims of sexual harassment. Now that alone, that number might be enough to convince you that this type of training is essential. But In addition to any concerns you might have over legal liability, you should also be concerned about the effects of sexual harassment in your workplace. Because victims of sexual harassment report serious negative impacts on their physical and emotional health. And the worse the harassment is, the more severe the physical and emotional toll can be. And when the victims of harassment suffer, their employers do too, because job turnover, excessive use of sick leave, and lost productivity can all occur when your employees are harassed on the job. Sexual harassment can really cost your company, even if you never end up in court for it. Sexual harassment, it can get complicated because we know that people have different ideas about what is offensive and what is not. So to address that, the law asks us to consider how what it calls a, quote, reasonable person would feel in any particular situation. So this reasonable person test is a little complicated, but it comes into play here with the first type of illegal harassment, which is called a hostile work environment. So the question about hostile work environment is whether a reasonable person would find a particular environment intimidating, hostile, or abusive. And you'll want to think about whether the conduct was severe, but Less serious behavior could still be considered harassment if it happened frequently or if it went on for a really long time. So it's that severity or that pervasiveness, um, and that's what would make a reasonable person find the environment intimidating, hostile, or abusive. So that means that one single rude or possibly inappropriate comment probably won't create a hostile work environment, but if the comments are made often, it could become hostile. And as an example, uh, one request for a date from one employee to another would not typically create a hostile work environment, 
But if that employee continued to ask, even after it was made clear that the original request was turned down, it was unwelcome, those repeated requests could create or contribute to a legally hostile work environment. Now, on the other hand, if the conduct is severe, like inappropriate touching or something like that, even one instance could create a hostile work environment. So the second type of illegal harassment is what we call quid pro quo, and that literally means this for that. So an example of a situation where someone is required to put up with harassment to keep his or her job to get a promotion. Um, the harasser in this situation is essentially saying, you tolerate my behavior or give me something I want, and in return, I'll give you X. Now here, X could be a good review, it could be a job promotion, or it could even just be that the person is allowed to keep their job. Now this type of harassment is probably easier to spot than hostile work environment, just because the defini definition is a little clearer. So as a quid pro quo example, let's say Mary and her supervisor had an affair for three years. Now Mary ended that affair and her supervisor demoted her and cut her pay. Or maybe suddenly Mary's performance review was unjustly harsh, unlike all her previous reviews. In either case, Mary might be able to bring a case of sexual harassment against her employer. A quid pro quo situation typically requires some level of authority from the harasser, just like this example, um, because they need to have something to hold over the victim's head. So with this type of harassment, supervisors are more often the harassers than not. So six states, um, California, Connecticut, Illinois, Maine, New York, um, require some or all employers to train their employees about sexual harassment. From a general standpoint, these laws require employers to review the federal and state provisions prohibiting sexual harassment, and then also to distinguish it from other types of harassment. And then finally, to provide examples of sexual harassment and how to prevent it. So even in states where training is not required by the law, however, the EEOC highly, highly recommends it for all employers. In 2016, an EEOC task force um, also recommended using the bystander approach to training. You might have heard this. Um, it's a it's an approach based on violence prevention. Now, as the name implies, the bystander training encourages the people who are witnessing these potentially harassing situations to step in and defuse them. Um, because research has found that this bystander method is actually much more effective training than a traditional sexual harassment training program. And I think we've all probably taken those. They're awkward and weird and everyone just feels uncomfortable. So this type of approach can be really more effective. In most cases, employers will be held legally responsible for the behavior of their employees when it comes to sexual harassment, even if they weren't fully aware of that behavior. So a really good question to ask yourself is how confident are you that your supervisors, your team leaders, other members of your management team really fully understand the legal risks of sexual harassment and allowing it to happen? How about your general employees? Do they really know what it is? A lot of companies we talk to have concern about this, and that's why this training is so beneficial, even if it's not required in your state. We still highly recommend it. Um, all right, so that is it for sexual harassment. I'm going to throw it back to Ed for a second. See you, Ed. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to once again mention uh, training on demand available through J.J. Keller. We hope you had an opportunity to select your poll earlier. If you did not, do be aware you can find out more information at jjkeller.com or simply at jjkellertraining.com. And I think with that, we have about 10 minutes left. I'm going to turn things over to Kevin, and we'll go through a bunch of your questions. I know we had a whole bunch of them come in. Yeah, sure thing. Excellent. Great, great job, both of you. We thank you for your insights and expertise. We'll get it right back to you shortly, but just before we do start that q and I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen now. Your input's important because it will help us improve future webcasts. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. And as for that lower left portion of the screen, just a reminder to folks, if you've not done so already, you are able to download the slides from today's presentation by clicking the resources widget there at that lower left part of the screen. With that, let's get to some questions. 
First, could you please provide a concise example of a bystander training? Oh, sure. That is a great question. Um, yeah, we didn't cover it too much, didn't have a lot of time to get into it too deep. Um, but one really great example of bystander training is um, training everyone to understand what sort of behavior counts as sexual harassment. Um, but you do it through the lens of if you see this happening, how would you feel? How would you react? Would you be willing to step in? Because asking them to imagine it happening to someone else and by someone else creates this opportunity for them to feel like a, sort of a helpful, helpful person, a helper, a bystander, instead of traditional training, which asks them to either feel like the victim or the harasser. Um, no one really wants to identify with either of those things, and that's why that kind of training just isn't as effective. So using the bystander approach says, you're a good person, and you're just doing your job, and you're witnessing this ugly situation. What do you think you can do about it? And then giving them some um, options. We have, in our training, for instance, we have an uh, acronym. It's IDEA, which is intervene, direct, elevate, or approach. And we give examples of use any of those approaches to step into a situation, even if it's just something as simple as like slamming a door or walking between people to get somewhere, um, just to remind them that someone is there. Um, it, there are a lot of different approaches, but really the core of bystander training is to teach people how to recognize bad behavior and let them know that they have the power to intervene. They don't have to just let it happen. And in fact, stepping in is their duty and, and it won't, you know, it's not dangerous necessarily to step in. And so it's, it's a really effective training method and um, studies of time and time again have shown that. So we really believe in it. I hope that helps. Okay, the next question. Uh, how long are employers required to save the safety data sheets? Oh, I saw those. We saw a couple of those come in. Uh, safety data sheets don't actually technically need to be maintained. They can be. Uh, the bloodborne, or excuse me, the HASCOM regulation doesn't refer to uh, retention period specifically, but it refers to another regulation, uh, employee exposure medical records, and that says duration of employment plus 30 years. So what it actually says is you must retain a record of the chemical used and the area where it was used, and you must retain that for duration of employment plus 30 years. Now, the safety data sheets could be part of that record. Obviously, that would show you exactly what chemical was used, and you need a record of the dates they were used. But technically, the SDSs don't have to be saved. It's just that uh, keeping them as part of that record is a fairly common practice. So it is that 30-year retention period. I hope that helps. Does a forklift operator certification expire after three years? Oh, that's one we've gotten too. Uh, forklift operators have to be evaluated every three years, but that doesn't mean that the certification you've given expires. Uh, technically, the certification does not expire, but as I mentioned, you, you do need to do that evaluation every three years and document that it was done. If you did not perform and evaluate that documentation, OSHA could cite you for that. Um, it would be a failure to do the evaluation, which I think is a different paragraph from the requirement to certify that the operator has been trained. So it's a bit of splitting hairs maybe that technically it's a violation uh, for not keeping up with the operator training provisions, but it's the certification itself did not technically expire. So thank you for that one. Sure thing. Uh, next one. If a supervisor keeps a first aid kit in his or her office, could he or she be covered by the bloodborne pathogen rule? Oh, that is also a good one. Uh, that's something that's come up when we've talked about occupational exposure. So there's a little bit of an odd one here where OSHA had said, if you have an employee who other workers regularly go to for help with uh, first aid cases or with their injuries, and the employer is aware that everyone goes to that worker, that person becomes a de facto designated first responder, even if you as the employer have not designated them. So two ways that we've seen this happen, one is that uh, an employee works evenings perhaps as a, an, EA, an EMT, emergency medical technician. 
other employees are aware of this, so when they get hurt at work, they all go to that individual for assistance. Well, the company may not have designated him as a first responder, but if they become aware that everyone keeps going to the same individual, that's considered occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens. The other way we've seen it is, as the questioner mentioned, uh, the supervisor keeps the first aid kit in his office. Injured employees come in, so the supervisor helps them with their injuries. That can also be considered uh, occupational exposure de facto. In fact, in reality, they're they're acting as if they were a designated first responder. So the, the supervisor in that case probably does need bloodborne pathogens training. So that's a good one also. Thank you. Next one concerns uh, some specifics with BBP training. Would it be required for residential plumbers or HVAC technicians? And also, would it be required for office employees who have CPR AED certifications and are updated every two years through uh, American Heart Association or the Red Cross? Uh, so for the first one, HVAC technicians, plumbers, things like that, they should not have exposure to blood, I would think, uh, in a normal condition. I think we had one earlier. Plumbers, we do get questions about because they may have exposure to sewage, but actually OSHA does not consider raw sewage to be uh, an effective transmit, transmitted, uh, you know, effective medium like an other potentially infectious material. They do not consider sewage to be effective at that. Obviously, raw sewage has other issues, but plumbers are not covered simply because they might have that exposure. The individual would need to have some reasonably anticipated exposure to blood. So probably they're not covered in their normal job duties, but depending on what duties have been assigned to them, they could be. Uh, again, exposure to sewage, though, is not sufficient. The office workers trained is an interesting one because, as I mentioned, you may train workers in first aid or CPR, but you might not designate them to be first responders. You can certainly provide the training, uh, but if you don't expect them to act as first responders, then they don't have occupational exposure even though they've been trained. It's kind of a little twist there, but it, it does happen. So I hope that clarifies. Next one asks, how long do I need to keep my old MSDS book? I uh, think we kind of covered that one a little bit. Your your SDSs or your MSDSs are under the retention period. You have a record of the chemical for duration of employment plus 30 years. Once you've received a new SDS to replace an old MSDS, you I don't believe you're required to retain the older one. The current one should be what you've got unless there's been some significant change in the chemical itself that uh, prompted the update. You may need... I would I would want to look that one up, but you may need older uh, older versions if the chemical has changed. But that would be indicated on on the sheet itself. Otherwise, uh, again, you don't necessarily have to save them forever, but just save a record of the chemical that was used for duration of employment plus 30 years. These sheets themselves could theoretically be tossed. All right. Um, can one person deliver the classroom material and an experienced operator present the practical training? Oh, for powered industrial truck training. I saw we had a couple of those. Yeah, you can absolutely team up on training. So you can have one individual who is maybe a better classroom speaker, uh, is more familiar with that part. They could deliver part of the training, and then you can have a second person who delivers the hands-on, the practical, and does the evaluations. Absolutely, you can team up trainers. So we say designated trainer or qualified trainer, uh, but that could include having more than one person team up to do the training if you feel that would provide the most effective training. So, yeah, you can certainly have two people participate, two or more, participate in, in powered industrial truck training. Excellent question. All right. Um, have time for one more question. Uh, is there any work group that stands out for workplace bullying? Oh, that's, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not sure we could pinpoint one specific work group, but um, just as we kind of talked about under sexual harassment, a lot of times under bullying, we actually find that um, supervisors and managers are more often the bullies than um, regular employees. And it's, it's not clear if that's because just sort of they're exposed to more people during the day, so more people and more people sort of taking issue with their manager than they would with just a regular coworker or not. But um, studies keep showing us that more often than not, um, bullies 
our managers or supervisors. So if that's a topic you want to address in your workplace, um, don't forget to train your supervisors and your managers that they can be bullies, not just to look out for bullying, but they themselves are at greater risk of being seen as bullies. Um, and that can really do a number on your workplace morale too. So don't forget to train them on that specifically. So that's a really interesting question. Thank you for that. Well, certainly, and, and we thank you both. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time today. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to our speakers. Once again, we hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen and give us your feedback. So that ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Edwin Zaleski and Potrance, everyone at JJ Keller, and all of you who listened in. Thank you, and have a great and safe day.